So if I was to say to you, socialism is impossible, what would you think? Would you think that me saying socialism is impossible would be presumptuous? Or would it be kind of begging the question? Or would it be just, hey, he's making some ideological kind of comment up there? What would you think if I said socialism is impossible? Are those the kind of questions you might have? What other questions might you have when I make a statement like that? Socialism is impossible. Has that been done before? Hasn't it been done before? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. What else might you ask? Can you do under what circumstances exactly? Under what circumstances? That's, that's a real good point. How has it been implied before? Uh, what has it looked like? Anything else you might say? Well, I think the latter questions really get into maybe a better way to think about it. The real important question is, what do I mean by socialism? You ought to pin me down real quick whether I'm an advocate or a critic of socialism. What is, what is it we're talking about? How do we define that? It's very, very important. Another question that's very related to that is, what do you mean by it's impossible? In what sense? That word is deliberately chosen by me because that was a central part of what we call the socialist calculation debate. We'll get to that later in the course. But we have to have a baseline of common terms or you're never going to have any ability to be able to understand the issues that we're talking about. So uh, we're starting tonight to cover a very brief uh, session on socialism. You're here for a one credit hour course. By necessity, that means it's going to be very brief. We can't cover, we could cover uh, at least a semester on socialism, uh, all uh, 17 hours of your credit load and more if we wanted to study it in depth. But uh, fortunately, I don't think for the purposes that you all signed up for this class, we need to go that level of depth, uh, but, but we do need to go in, into a little bit to give you, I, I hope to be able to give you enough depth that you feel like, hey, we fairly covered some of the issues and that you understand it. And I've given you some resources to be able to go deeper as you have time on your own. So this first question, what do we mean by socialism? Well, what is in the name? Uh, you know, kind of, it's really, really interesting. I think many of you signed up for this class in large part because of the cultural moment that we're in. Uh, you know, we have uh, presidential candidates advocating socialism. Uh, we have, uh, and we'll see uh, some of the survey data, a large number of Americans being in favor of socialism. But one of the very interesting things is as we look at the current Democratic primary as it's starting to whittle down, we have two candidates, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Uh, you know, are they the same kind of candidate or are they different? And I say it's because it's interesting. Ms. Warren has says, quote, I'm a capitalist to my bones, right? And, and yet Senator Sanders says that he's, and he's been an avowed democratic socialist for decades. Yet their policies seem very, very similar. So what, what does it mean when we say someone's a socialist, when we have a capitalist to her bones being equal in policy prescription to uh, someone that is an avowed democratic socialist? Uh, the policy is very similar. Uh, obviously, uh, lots of expansive government programs, free government programs uh, that would resonate uh, with young people like t a tuition, uh, free tuition. Uh, but, but yet, uh, they do have di different rhetoric and tone. So obviously, a couple different perspectives uh, that one could think about when we think about this term of uh, socialism. But it, uh, it, it does resonate, this, this idea... And, and we see it uh, resonating a lot amongst younger people, especially. Uh, and, and so there's a couple uh, polls that we, we've got listed here. Uh, this, the first one is, is kind of views towards socialism. You see the favorable, favorable, unfavorable ratings. And if you notice, the, the net favorable, the only age group that is, is net favorable towards socialism are the 18 to 24 years olds. Uh, and then it, it declines as you, you, you age until right at the end. 
uh, older people start, start to head back the other direction. Uh, but, but even getting back to kind of the central point I was making a moment ago, when you start looking at the definition of, of socialism uh, over on the right-hand side, you see that uh, uh, very few millennials actually can even define socialism. And we're going to get to the definition in just a minute. But, but if we don't have a common understanding of what it means, then it's clearly going to be impossible for us to agree whether we want something like that or not. Uh, that's what makes this kind of a, such a tricky issue. I, I mean, and to be fair, before I, I move on, uh, you even saw that with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? She, she, when pressed, it says, well, it really depends on, on which kind of uh, social she talked to. Some would be okay with capitalists, some, capitalists, and some would not. Uh, well, that, that makes this uh, issue really hard to work. Here's another kind of a poll, last kind of data point on polls, but you start to see some of this, this age group kind of manifest itself a little bit with, with a little bit more specificity, uh, the kinds of things uh, that, that people would like. As you read this, the overall total across all population groups is kind of the, the gray shaded area, and you see the, the summation of millennials and Gen Z. So, so government being more active, i.e. providing universal health care, you can see uh, younger people are more interested in that. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, young people would be in favor of tuition-free college, uh, that that would be there at a much greater rate. Uh, uh, kind of shockingly is, is the, the large number that would prefer living in a socialist country. Uh, again, get, given the debate on not understanding what socialism is, you can understand why. Uh, if you ask someone, my generation, do you want to live in a socialist country? We think, do I want to go to Venezuela? Do I want to go to North Korea? If you think, um, perhaps even uh, more realistically, if you think, uh, for a younger person, uh, do I want to live in Northern Europe? And, and those, are, those are two entirely different ways of looking at it, and you could see why that would be, lead to a different result. Uh, and, and so, so uh, even though there's still a broad support down the, the lower two categories for, for things that we would typically associate with be, being more supportive of markets, you do see that the younger generation is a little bit less in favor of, of uh, those things than, than older generations. Uh, interestingly enough to me, the kind of the thing that struck me, that government should allow private insurance. Uh, I'm glad to see that 80% are agree, but the fact that 20% do not want to allow us to have private insurance seems to me to be striking in, in levels of control when we start thinking about those words. So, so I want to set the stage a little bit to, to, to understand uh, why this might be, that young people might have this predilection uh, towards socialism. Uh, so, so when you were young, you, I th think small, right? Your parents were, uh, they, they were almost like uh, Superman, Superwoman. I mean, they did everything right. You trusted uh, your parents generally implicitly. If you went to them for answers you never questioned, <clears throat> it was, it, you could say, think that everything that they were going to say was going to be right. The problem happens, of course, at some point you become a teenager, you start seeing more problems in the world. You see that, that perhaps kind of this, this idyllic kind of view I had of the world is not so idyllic. You see injustices. You see problems in your parents and, and other adults uh, that, hey, they don't have this all figured out. Uh, and it starts to leading you to a question. Can we not do better than the way that I'm starting to see this world? It's, it's rather striking when you see some of the, the, the really bad things that happen. Uh, can we not do something about and, and so you're, you're fed a line also uh, uh, that, hey, your generation is going to solve all these problems. Pretty high weight you put on your shoulders. Maybe a little unfair, maybe a little unrealistic to think that somehow your generation is going to be able to solve all problems that have never here, heretofore been solved, right? Uh, you know, I, I once had a professor, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague, I should say, uh, he used to say, uh, these problems aren't easy. If they were easy, they'd been solved a long time ago. And that really is true. Uh, the, the, the problems and the concerns that we have, uh, whatever the issue is, are difficult problems. And, and to think that uh, the, j just if, if, if we had more moral people, that somehow we would solve these problems is a little bit idealistic. Uh, it does not mean we should try, and that's kind of the point where we're getting. Because the status quo is not acceptable. I want to encourage you that the feeling that this world is messed up in a, in a fundamental way is the right conclusion. And you know that because you know that we, humanity, 
messed it up with our sin. We know that this world is cursed. We know that there will be no utopia until Jesus Christ returns on his throne. But until he comes, we are still given the same dominion mandate we had in the garden to, in effect, make this world a little bit better place. And so we cannot be uh, satisfied with the status quo in any area. <clears throat> so that, to, again, you have friends <clears throat> that may be uh, listening to the siren song of socialism because they think we can do better. You can completely agree with them. We can and we must do better in our world. Uh, one of the, I think, perhaps the, the, the best, strongest point, not the strongest, but the, the most effective way that, that socialists argue is the status quo is the capitalist system, and their system has not been tried. So, so anything that is today is, is associated with capitalism, all the negatives, right? And then the utopian uh, idealist point of view is held out as a model. And in, in, in actuality, it's a lot more nuanced than that, and we'll talk about that in this course. I mean, we should not uh, 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 r really be surprised that people would want to be looking to get back to some more idyllic nature. We, we have this uh, uh, really internal desire uh, to return to the garden, and we have the promise and the hope that there will be a renewed heavens and a re renewed earth. And until that time, uh, Ecclesiastes tells us that God has set eternity in our hearts. And it's not just that God has set eternity in your hearts. God has set eternity in the hearts of every human being. That means that there's a yearn for the transcendent. There's a yearn, even when not acknowledged, there's a yearn to, to make things right. And so that's a good, good feeling to all Americans, to all people of the world that want to make the world a better place. Uh, but we'll see that there's, there's some ways that may be more effective than others to make the world a better place. So where are we going in this course? Got a couple charts to kind of describe this. Uh, first is what I'm going to call big picture issues. These, in part, were uh, influenced by the emails that you all sent me. Uh, I asked, uh, or the can through Canvas uh, back in December, <clears throat> for you all to give me uh, kind of your concerns, what you'd like to learn in a course like this. We're going to define what socialism, and we're, we're going to start that process today, uh, what it is so you can understand more about it. Uh, we're going to go over, and even just some of the brief comments I just made, starts to get at some of the reasons why I think you understand why people would be attracted to socialism, the fact that there are th things that they see uh, that, that are, could, could and should be rectified. Uh, we are going to look, many of you asked, and one of you asked the first question, hasn't socialism been tried? How has it worked before? That's a, a key question we're going to examine the course. Uh, and, and, and kind of the follow-on question is, is there a, a different kind, a better kind of socialism that could work? One of the uh, key points of uh, proponents of socialism is always that <clears throat> I don't want that kind of socialism. I'm, I'm interested in a different kind of socialism. And it's not surprising. I mean, none of us, and, and we should not uh, cast aspersions on motives of people uh, that, that want socialism, that they want to be uh, like Lenin or, or, or Stalin or, or Hitler even, which is a type of socialism. We'll, we're going to get to that. Uh, uh, people have, have different goals, uh, but those goals don't always lead to good results. But are, is there some kind of socialism that could work more effectively? We'll look at that. <clears throat> we're going to look a lot, uh, in fact, one whole lesson on this idea of inequality. At the end of the day, uh, you're going to see, we're going to spend a fair amount of time because you're in a, a special topics in economics. We're going to look at the economics of socialism. But the reality is, the appeal to socialism is not economic at the end of the day. The appeal to socialism is a moral claim. And the moral foundation of that claim is based on a more equal, and by the definition of those that make that uh, 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 determination, a more just distribution of wealth and income in the world. <clears throat> so we're going to look at that, and specifically uh, how a Christian should think about it. Uh, and, and kind of towards the latter part of the course, we're going to do at least one lesson kind of contrasting, okay, what would be the alternative with, with a free market system? I, I've, I've suggested that uh, one of the, the, the biggest strengths or, or, uh, and the strategies of those advocating for socialism is, is to say that the current system is kind of a, 
uh, capitalism in a free market system. And in fact, uh, the, that's, it's not really uh, reflective of that. It's, it's a crony capitalist system. Uh, uh, you know, so how, how does that compare? It, we'll find that, that neither, uh, you, neither advocacy of, of a system, either utopian vision is actually in practice. It's somewhere in the, the, the middle. In, in reality, there is an economy in the world that is an, a mixed interventionist economy at some level. The question is, in what d ways, in what uh, uh, degrees do we have interventionism in the economy? And to the extent, is that the problem or the solution? That's part of, of the discussion. So that's the big picture, specifically things we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to take a look at historical socialism, uh, different uh, areas that, that have, have happened. Uh, we're going to contrast that with communism, fascism, and capitalism at a theoretical level. Uh, we're going to look at those practical attempts at socialism and, and more, more specifically what the result has been. Uh, we'll spend probably the next several lessons uh, going through uh, economic calculation. We're going to see that there's a fundamental problem of trying a central planning process in the economy. And, and we'll, we'll spend a quite a, a large amount of time to see. And you'll find that that's why I use that term uh, that socialism is impossible early in the, the introduction to today's lesson. Uh, we're going to ask the question, is the European socialist model really socialist? And in what way would you consider it to be socialist? Uh, so, so we'll find that, that, in fact, many of the Europeans that are called socialists uh, have said, no, we're not socialist. Uh, Mr. Sanders, would you please stop saying we're socialist? Uh, and so the, we're also going to look specifically at this, where, what's the ultimate source and the purpose of inequality from a Christian worldview. <clears throat> I will, as a kind of a um, proofread ahead, if you will, I'm going to assert to you now, and we'll see it uh, later on in the course, that there is a purpose in inequality. And not all inequalities are bad. And not all equalities are good. There, there's, there's a rationale that, that's involved. We'll see that later in the course. <clears throat> So let's uh, now go to, <clears throat> excuse me, through what I will call some stylized facts about socialist experience. Uh, some of the things we've seen is that the, the nations that have actually tried socialism uh, have had massive economic pro uh, problems. Uh, you can see the list of the, the nations that, that, we've, that have tried this in the past. And... Uh, Again, we've heard the critique uh, of many current advocates of socialism that that's not socialism. And, and, and at one level, that's a fair critique because that's not what they mean to say. But at another level, it's, of course, not fair at all for them to, to defend that way because the, the countries that we see listed there explicitly said we are implementing socialism. The USSR is, after all, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or they were before they fell. Uh, uh, Mao and, and Chairman Mao and China were implementing socialist policy. And, and so, uh, uh, Venezuela, we're going to have uh, lessons on all these later, but uh, just to set the stage, uh, one of the current debates, of, of course, is the unfolding chaos and tragedy that is going on in Venezuela. And many of the progressives that are advocating for socialism today, of course, deny that Venezuela is a socialist state. That, however, is not what Mr. Chavez uh, said when he implemented his socialist revolution. Uh, you know, just a decade or two ago, uh, nor Mr. Maduro, who is the current uh, kind of dictator in charge. They believe they're implementing socialism, whether we believe it or not, and it's leading to massive problems. Uh, you've probably seen this chart. If you haven't, worth seeing again. And it's the picture of North Korea at night with the one kind of uh, light spot uh, being Pyongyang, uh, the capital of North Korea. Uh, and it's a desperately poor country uh, economically. <clears throat> the, and to, to be fair, this is perhaps arguably the worst case because in addition to practicing uh, socialism, uh, North Korea has a national policy of autarky, i.e. Uh, self-sufficiency. They want to produce everything on their, on their own, <clears throat> which means they're only as good as they are. Uh, whereas other nations, even other socialist nations, often will trade and get the benefits of the division of labor and gains from specialization. Uh, so North Korea has compounded one economic error with another, which leads to these kinds of results. 
another thing that's important is, is, is clearly the uh, amount of people that are, have, have died in the pursuit of socialism in the last century. The uh, common <coughs> estimate is 100 million people were killed in the 20th century. Uh, we've got a subgroup. I'm going to go ahead and bring this uh, picture up. This is a picture of all the sources of death in the, uh, the 20th century with ideology uh, and uh, communism being over here in the mic. Uh, but it's, it's, it's right, well, there we go. It's in this area right here, well, humanity. There's uh, about, that's communism. Uh, I can't read it very well here. I'll probably go back to the, the other version to blow that up. Uh, but communism, 94 million that are dead. And notice communism, the, the way this is set up, is separate from fascism which is another form of socialism we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, and, and then we, we can see that the breakout of where that is in different co countries. That number is debatable. A lot of the people that are, are supportive of socialism say that's a made-up number. It's not anywhere near that big. Let's, let's assume that it's not 100 million. Let's say it's only 25 million. It's 25 million people that died in pursuit of that ideology. And it's much closer to 100 million. So the point is, it's not the number per se. It's that the pursuit of a socialist vision has resulted in a lot of death. <clears throat> that does not mean, of course, that someone that wants to have universal health care necessarily wants to kill millions of people, right? That, that's, that would be a, a poor extrapolation of this data. That being said, uh, for those that are advocates of universal health care, when they throw out the term, I am a socialist, in light of this historical reality, are tone deaf to the max about what socialism can do when it goes awry. So, so uh, there should be a lot more humility in the choice of terms that we use. If we're going to use the term socialism, and we don't like all the baggage that it brings, how about just another term? Because uh, I would assert to you that much, many of those that are in uh, favor of socialism are not really in favor of the system, as we're going to find in just a moment. And so we don't have to go down the, 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 the way this baggage uh, tends to lead. Because it is, it is pretty bad. This, the most recent uh, graphic, and many of you are probably familiar, and I'm going to go ahead and show the graphic bigger, uh, photos uh, just to make the point. But look, before we do that, the Khmer Rouge uh, in Cambodia uh, implemented a, uh, a socialist uh, a state in the period of 1975 to 1979. And that resulted in 2 million people dying, at least, in, in the most brutal of conditions. You can see the words in their constitution, kind of those, those uh, ideals that they had. They, they probably don't sound unfamiliar to you, do they? Right? We're in favor of genuine happiness, equality, justice. They're in favor of socialism. They're promoting equality, justice, that there's no exploitation, no exploiters, no exploit, exploited. So when people of my generation that have heard these words before and see where this takes us, we have a, a little bit of a pause when we hear those terms. And the fact that, that the proponents of, of those views say, we don't want to go there, well, many of the people that went there before never wanted it to go there at the start. So, so we have to be very, very careful about what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, social, there, there are worse uh, graphic pictures of it, but the horror uh, that they inflicted uh, because the scale was unprecedented. This country has never really recovered from uh, the murders regime. So uh, when we think about it, those are extremes. Here's some better results. And that, that helps us think about this a little bit as well, right? Uh, some of the countries that have tried to implement certain goals of socialism have done relatively well. And that's typically these examples that are held out in, in favor of socialism. The Nordic countries specifically are, are listed as examples of what perhaps we would like to have in a socialist uh, regime. Uh, but as I say in that first sub bullet, those countries say, we're not socialist. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, the uh, prime minister, the ex-prime minister of, of Sweden, uh, publicly castigated Mr. Sanders, stop calling us a socialist. We are not socialists. Just because you want to, we, we're not you. Uh, what, they, what they do have in, in those countries is a, is a larger welfare state. We're going to have a whole uh, uh, lesson 
on the, that example to see, which is a nutshell now to, to set the stage. In many respects, they are less socialist than we are. Just one case in point. The Nordic countries generally, their educational system, while the state pays for all of it, they give vouchers and the free market actually provides all education. There are no public schools in the sense that we have them. The individual citizens decide where those vouchers will be spent. Again, the public pays all of the cost, but there are, there's competition in the provision of services. So who's more socialist, us or Sweden? You start to see it's a, it's a, a more nuanced uh, picture when we start looking at that. Um, further, we've seen that historically those countries have had significant problems to the extent that they make their welfare state uh, larger and larger. Uh, and many of them have had to have significant reforms to, to make them more competitive. So, so th there is some nuance there again. And uh, the further, even those that, uh, that pursue socialism aggressively have been forced <coughs> sooner or later to embrace some sort of pursuit of markets um, at the, at, after the Bolshevik Revolution, <coughs> Lenin implemented uh, um, his, his socialist state and, 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 dro and eliminated money totally. And without money and without prices, the economy totally collapsed. And he was forced to revert to a new five-year plan and introduce money. Still didn't work well, but he had to do something to get a little bit closer to market because he could not even operate at all. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, when he took over after Mao, uh, had the, the, the quote, hey, starving uh, is not uh, capitalism. It's, it's not what we're, we're about. We, we can in, implement market reforms. And uh, whatever we think of China's system today, it's clearly not the completely centrally planned economy of the socialist model. And that's led to the uh, significant growth that they've had. Uh, Gorbachev was forced to, to uh, implement, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the, the last premier of the, the Soviet Union, was forced to implement his perestroika campaign or openness campaign uh, uh, to to uh, perestroika to open up the economy to try to bring market processes into their economy uh, because they could not uh, feed their people and, and and compete effectively. So so these are kind of some some facts we've seen if we start looking at the broad bit picture. We're going to come back to all of them uh, as we go through the course. Here's, here's another kind of uh, good statistic. We, again, we, we see that some of these uh, uh, countries, have, they, they may implement socialist policy, but they seem to work out fairly well. That, that again, kind of couples, dovetails back with the previous chart. Uh, high welfare state uh, capitalism, which is really what the, the Nordic countries are, uh, leads to some pretty happy results for some people. Uh, so, so it's not necessarily going to lead to all bad results. Now, why do we have socialism? Now, we're going to start going through some a little bit more technical definitional uh, reasons for socialism, definitions you want to kind of capture. First reason uh, is that, that we have socialism or a cause for socialism is to overcome what's called the anarchy of capitalist production. For, for, for Karl Marx and, uh, and his version of socialism, he referred to this as alienation when we had, had different producers trying to make the same product, necessarily their plans would be frustrated, they would be waste. So it would be kind of analogous in America to say, well, this is uh, terrible that we have both Ford and General Motors making automobiles because you're only going to buy one, and the planning for one that, that you don't end up buying is, <clears throat> to a large degree, a wasted effort. Uh, so if instead we could centrally plan and figure out what, and we had the, the best knowledge of what you truly wanted to consume, then we would have l less redundancy and less wasted effort. The market process, uh, Marx was amazed. He was amazed at the, that the way the market led to the high output. He praised, actually, the capitalist system as an incredibly uh, powerful producer of goods and services. He just thought, and we're going to get to it next lesson when I go more explicitly into Marxism. He just thought it could do so much better and it would evolve to a point where the government could do the same as capitalism, only better because we wouldn't have this duplication of effort and what he called the alienation. 
Okay. The second reason we've already touched on, but make, make no mistake, this is the driving uh, claim, especially today uh, with respect to socialism. It's, it's a call to end uh, or, or reduce at least inequality. Uh, and so you see the way I've defined it here, the distribution is determined consciously according to some social value of fairness with pay or, or remuneration more clearly defined uh, or tied to the social value of the output. Uh, the current advocates, uh, and you've heard these kinds of calls, there is no connection between a CEO making $10 million and his or her performance, right? Uh, uh, economic theory suggests the, the, the worker, every stage of, of the production process is paid according to what they kind of put into the product. Well, this is a very hard thing for many people to swallow when they see the, the captains of industry making so much more and they can't see that that possibly could be justified by their contribution to output. And so what they would like to do is change the, uh, the terms of the output uh, of, of, of the distribution. And that's one of the main reasons why they have to own the means of production is so that they can direct how much people are paid according to the production process. Uh, they, they simply, on the last word that I've got there, meritocracy, uh, most advocates of socialism deny that our current uh, primarily free market but intervention system is, it has any meritocracy at all. It's uh, just uh, uh, based on the whims of those that have power that are able to exploit those that do not. The last area should not be minimized is, is simply the idea of, of wanting to have control. Uh, we be able to decide what is produced uh, and, and so forth. I, I thought the best quote is here, Bernie Sanders during his campaign uh, against Mrs. Clinton a couple years ago, uh, kind of epitomizes this. We don't need 23 choices of deodorants and 18 choices of sneakers when kids are going hungry. That's rhetorically powerful. And that's kind of a driving factor. So, there are a certain subset of the population that want to be able to control what is produced and for whom. And so that's an aspect of the appeal for socialism as well. So what is socialism per se? How would we define it? Well, historically, we've had this, this common definition that uh, the uh, state owns the means of production, all the capital goods. So uh, uh, you own consumer goods. You're able to, with whatever you're paid, and there would be pay in a socialist system, you would have the right to do, uh, do with that as you will. But the state would own the means of production, all the capital goods, and would determine what would be produced and how it would be produced. And that, the purpose of that would be to serve those broader social goals, goals of, as the last chart suggested, not only are to hit what should be produced, but what the distribution of the proceeds of that production, how, how it would be distributed amongst the population. There are many variations of socialism. You know, we've got the classic definition, but uh, th this word, as we start off today's uh, discussion, is, is almost so abstract. It can mean anything to, to whoever hears it, which is why it's so important for us to kind of pin it down. You can read some of the uh, kind of ways people think about I care for the poor, therefore I'm a socialist. I like a fair world, so I'm a socialist. For those that are hostile to socialism, you want my stuff, therefore you're a socialist. Right? Uh, everybody should have health care, so I'm a socialist. Uh, and the, the last point is, is really kind of important. What socialism is not is what we have today, and that's their strongest point. When you don't like what's here today, they can hold it out to this very abstract promise of a better future if we just are brave enough to go down that path. And that's what socialism has always uh, pointed out. And conversely, the last sub-bullet, if you do not embrace that, you are guilty of supporting the status quo. That's a particularly effective a strategy they have. You mean you don't want socialism? You, you, you want people to, to die, to starve to death? To, to not have health care, that, that's a, a difficult uh, uh, thing to, to combat. So that's uh, some of the ways that people think about socialism. Uh, I, I, I wanted to find the, the, uh, a video, which I could not do, 
there, there is uh, some polls, and I saw some of it, it was a very small percentage, so you should take, take heart that it was such a small percentage. But a certain amount of young people today thought that socialism was uh, being on Facebook and Instagram and things like that. I, I was pleased with that, that. If that's what they're supporting with socialism, I'm okay. Uh, the harshest critics of socialism are often the true believers. <clears throat> it's, it's analogous to the, uh, the true believers condemning the heretics, uh, like a Christian might be hostile towards a Jehovah's Witness for giving a false view of the Trinity and what true Christianity is about. Uh, Marx, Marx absolutely excoriated other socialists, especially the utopian socialists of his day. Uh, he, he just had utter contempt and vitriol in his writings for those that advocated socialism that did not embrace his scientific socialism. We'll, we'll cover it next time, but uh, those that tried to describe what socialism meant he was especially hostile towards because uh, uh, Marx would never define what socialism was. He defined it in terms of its antithesis, capitalism. Okay, so what are these kind of economic systems that we have? Uh, kind of way to frame it. These are just kind of definitional. It's, it's good to, to be aware of. Got one uh, kind of table to maybe think about it. Uh, and, and the way I've structured this is simply uh, the ownership of consumers' goods and producers' goods. And, and producers' goods, I mean the factories, the capital equipment, uh, the, the, those kinds of things. So, so in capitalism, uh, w both consumers' goods and producers' goods are privately owned. Okay? That's kind of the starting point. Uh, fascism is interesting. And, and, and please, let me pause right here. Do not think of fascism as Nazism, at least for this class. Nazism was an application of fascism, but not all fascists want to kill a bunch of people, right? Uh, and certainly not for nationalistic, racist reasons. Uh, there are other species of, of fascism. And it's important because you're going to actually see in just a moment in the next chart that a lot of what the kinds of ideas that we have about uh, fascism are still around today that look a little bit differently. So, so fascism, uh, the consumer's goods, as with capitalism, are privately owned. Ostensibly under fascism, the producer's goods are privately owned, but they're not really. And in a fascist state, the, uh, the firms are basically take direction from the state. They're told what to produce, why, and for what purposes. So, so perhaps a better way to think about uh, uh, the, the, me, the uh, producer's goods in a free market system, the, uh, the pro producer's goods are controlled by entrepreneurs that can decide how and what to produce and what kinds of ways to produce. That's not the way a fascist system works. A fascist system is more like a manager that has to do what is told by the, the, the bigger uh, uh, CEO, if you will. So even though it's, they would get any profits that might uh, remain, it's not that some of them wouldn't be distributed to the public. That could happen, although much would go back to the state. But it's, it's really the state direction of the resources towards national uh, goals. That, that, that marks national socialism uh, and fascism. A socialism itself, uh, uh, proper, is, is going to have uh, privately owned consumer goods, uh, and it's going to have all of the means of production owned by the state. Uh, so, so this one would not uh, have the, the control that we're going to see in the last one, which is communism. In communism, the public would own even the consumer goods as well as the capital goods. Uh, <clears throat> but in reality, they would be publicly allocated, but, but you do get to consume them, obviously, privately. So communism takes, national so, uh, or takes socialism a, a little bit further, if that makes sense. Okay, who's socialism? Uh, we, we've already kind of defined the historical socialism, but I, I would tell you, it's interesting because almost nobody would advocate that kind of socialism today. Uh, not that there aren't people out there, but, but the reality is, if you own the means of production, if you own everything, guess what? You're responsible. That's why, certainly in America, no politician wants to own the company. It's much better to let the private sector own it and tell them what to do if you want to uh, kind of control the economy. Then when it doesn't work out well, they failed, and you can yell at them again. Uh, that's kind of a, a better model. We see that a lot. Uh, so, so 
I've got two definitions. I, I made my own terms. Reality, and that's probably as good as any, just because, as, as I've already kind of illustrated you, there's a million different labels, and everybody chooses their own label, but this is at least a framework for thinking about it. I'm going to call this uh, next one soft socialism. And we could arguably say that that's akin to kind of democratic socialists uh, of, 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 of both Europe and America. In this case, uh, government directs the private ownership towards the goals of those in power. So it's not complete socialism, but we're going to have that. And, and in a way, it's really a form, of, I would assert to you, of soft fascism, right? Uh, it's government direction of the economy without the nastiness of, uh, of fascism and kind of the, the baggage of uh, uh, you know, Mussolini or Hitler. Uh, much softer, but of the same uh, genus. Uh, then the, the last category would be social welfareism. And this is arguably maybe akin to what we might call a social democrat. Uh, in other words, this is much more interested in the socialist goal of wealth and inequality redistribution. Uh, but th this group has, has much less uh, desire for government involvement in the economy. They just want to make sure that the fruits of the economic activity are more evenly spread out amongst the population. So those are uh, different versions we might see. Uh, we will see that uh, I've, I've assigned you a book, uh, Thomas Sowell's Conflict of Visions. Uh, you should take a look at that. And it's in the library, and I hope you may have bought your own copy. But he makes the point in chapter one, we need to understand why people behave the way they do, because we see the same kind of people line up again and again, issue after issue. Why is it that's always the same person? If you're arguing with somebody on a political issue on one issue, you're probably arguing with that same person on another seemingly unrelated political issue. Why? And Thomas Sowell says it's, uh, the, it's, we have a different vision, and he defines that as uh, uh, the sense of how the world works. Uh, and and that, that sense is before you can have some theory of how the world is going to work, you're going to have this, this framework or vision. And it's necessarily something that's simple and abstract. It's a way to build a theory on. And, and the way that, that when we start thinking about things like, like uh, the economy, social visions are often a vision of how, what causes what. Uh, so, so you see some examples here of maybe two extremes. The poor are poor necessarily because of exploitation. Someone will bring that idea to the table before any facts are, are known. That's just the way they think it must be that. Likewise, other people, the other extreme might say, the poor are poor because they're lazy and won't work. And they'll bring that to, vision to the table before they even have a discussion. <clears throat> so we'll, we're going to go through that. I think you'll find that book actually the most helpful part of the course for those that came here wanting to understand why people kind of view the way they do about certain things. Uh, I would say a vision is not quite the same as a worldview, very closely related. Uh, it, it works at the same level, kind of those foundational presuppositions. Uh, but visions are often more explicit or implicit, if you will, whereas a worldview might give you explicit kind of concrete things to hold on to. So in conclusion for today, uh, I'm going to give you a Hayek's quote. Uh, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they know about what they imagine they could design. That's from his book, The Fatal Conceit. Uh, the idea that we know enough to plan, we're going to see that in the next several lessons, that that's a, a real problem. And the last thing I would uh, leave you with is from Matthew 22. Uh, verse 37 and, and following. Teacher, what is the greatest command in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great first commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. Here's the deal. Those that want to usher in an era of socialism want to love everybody with their hearts. And we should and they should. But we must also love our neighbor with our minds. We should look carefully at what is likely to happen from what we do. It is not enough to have good intentions. We must use our minds. God gave them to us for a reason, and that will lead to a better result.